Welcome to First United Lutheran Church. This is the message from Sunday. It's our prayer that this message touches your heart and helps to guide you in your life. Let's listen. Now let me say that the joy of the Lord being our strength, do you ever get tired of being portrayed in the religious um, or rather non-religious media as being some kind of religious sourpuss with a long face who thinks that everything that is fun must be a sin? If you get tired of that, I want to hear another amen. You know, one fellow said, as he was traveling along with his son, they saw a mule out in the pasture, and he said, Daddy, he said, that must be a Lutheran mule. He said, why is that? He said, because he has such a long face. To see some people today, you'd think that the one essential doctrine of Christianity is to have a face so long that you could eat oatmeal out of a gas pipe. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, and he once explained his choice of career this way. He said, quote, I might have entered the ministry of certain clergymen I knew had not looked and acted so much like undertakers. What happened to their joy? And ours. <laughs> Carl Winters, as one minister, appreciates the joyful worship and preaching. Uh, he says, when I preach, I try to make people laugh. And while they have their mouth open, I try to give them something to chew on. I know that's Mike's approach to preaching too. And as much as possible, it's mine. I don't try to be a comedian. I try to accurately portray law and gospel, but if I can open and get people to chuck a little, little bit, then it's easier to get them to chew on something. An old bishop in Virginia once uh, talked to a newly elected congressman who was known for making a lot of foolish decisions. He's, it was pouring down rain outside. He said, why don't you go outside? And he says, go outside, look up into the sky, and it will give you a revelation. He did as he was asked. He walked outside and he looked up into the sky. And a little while he came in just absolutely drenched, just soaked to the bone. He said, I feel like a blithering idiot. He said, that's your revelation. <laughs> now I've given you a chuckle, I'll give you something to chew on. Christ has one great purpose for believers, the completion of their joy. Christ is the primary source of joy. And John chapter 15 and verse 10, he said, My joy. It's not anyone else that can be the source of true joy in our lives, but only Jesus Christ. The angel of the Lord appeared to the three wise men and said, as they were terrified, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy. For unto you, a child is born that shall be to all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior is born to you, is Christ the Lord. Is it little wonder that during the Christmas season, we sing, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. When we know that the Lord is living within us, when we have Christ as our Savior, we truly have the source of joy. You cannot know the joy of the Lord until you have a personal relationship with the Lord of joy. That's why it's so important that we emphasize to you today, Confirmands, that you continue in word and sacrament, that as Jesus said, your joy may be full. Jesus' joy gave hope to the hopeless, encouragement to those who are disillusioned. In Matthew chapter 12 and verse 37, it says that the crowds heard him gladly, why? Because joy radiated from Jesus. Truly, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief in the sense that he took our sin and our suffering upon himself at the cross. But joy, the fruit of the Spirit, radiated from Jesus. That's why his disciples were all drawn to him. And of course, Romans 8.28 tells us, Beloved, we know that all things work together for good to those 
who love God and are the called according to His purpose. There's a difference between joy and happiness. The world looks for happiness. Christians experience joy. Joy is not dependent upon circumstances. They're both good feelings. They both are, make you feel giddy and, and uh, make you want to laugh and rejoice. But there's a difference between joy and happiness. Happiness comes from the root word hap. And it's a good feeling that is dependent upon circumstances. Whereas joy is that good feeling that you get which enables you to rise above your circumstances. As one fellow came along, he said, How are you doing today? He said, Pretty good under the circumstances. He says, Under them? Why don't you get on top of them? Through Jesus Christ, we can truly do that because all things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to His purpose. And His purpose is that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. Verse 29. Why do most renderings show, of Jesus show Him somber and serious looking? You ever wonder about that? I wonder about it if He was full of the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit is joy. A merry Jesus seems to be kind of sacrilegious to most people. But the fact is, that's what drew His disciples to Him. Wherever Jesus was, there was joy. I'd mentioned that the great D.L. Moody, the evangelist, was called upon to do a funeral. And he never did funerals because he was an evangelist, not a pastor. And as he looked in the Gospels to try to find some kind of example from Jesus on how to do a funeral, he couldn't find any. Because Jesus broke up every funeral he ever went to by raising that person from the dead. Wherever Jesus went, there was and is joy. The joy of the Lord was there when He turned water into wine with His first miracle. And folks, it was wine. It wasn't grape juice. People try to deny that today and do all kinds of theological geriatrics to try to uh, change it, but it was joy. And the joy of the Lord was there at the tomb of the resurrected Lazarus. You heard me mention the fact that when Lazarus walked out of that tomb, I'm sure that when he was raised from the dead, he didn't walk out of there going, well, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> he was shouting for joy, I'm sure, even though it's not specifically mentioned. Joy was there when the leper returned to thank Jesus. Joy was there when a woman caught in the act of adultery was forgiven and said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Joy was there when the deaf heard, the blind saw, the sick were healed, and the dead were raised. Everywhere Jesus went, there was and is joy. Joy was there when the boy gave him his lunch. Five loaves and two fish, so that the multitude could be fed. They were hungry. You ever been really hungry and had a good meal? And didn't have to pay for it? I can tell you, I'm pretty joyous. You know the difference between a good steak and a bad steak? When I go to a restaurant and I'm paying for it, I'll find something wrong with it. But if somebody else has paid for it, greatest steak I ever had. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But you know, the joy of the Lord was there when Jesus fed the multitudes. Joy was there when... Jesus forgave Zacchaeus for abusing his authority. Joy was there when Jesus stood up and said, Peace, be still, and stopped the storm. So where does someone find joy? I believe I mentioned this, but it's worth repeating. In my last message, I talked about it. Joy is an acrostic. J-O-Y. J stands for Jesus. O stands for zero. And why stands for you. When there is nothing between you and Jesus Christ. When you can say as Paul did, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, then you'll have joy that neither the world can give nor can take away. John 16, 24, he said, Until now you have not asked for anything in my name, 
Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. So the primary source of joy is Jesus Christ. The secondary source is the Word of God. These things I have told you that your joy may be full. These things refer to the promises given to us in God's Word. You know, as Lutherans, we believe that commands and threats of punishment are law. But promises, particularly those promises that relate to forgiveness, are gospel, good news. He gives us good news that our joy may be full. The precepts of the Lord are right, Psalm 19, 8, giving joy. To the heart. Jeremiah said, When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. Jeremiah 15 and verse 6. New Testament. Full of the joy of the Lord. You'll find people laughing, skipping, jumping, shouting when they are healed and when their lives are changed by a personal encounter with Christ. Now notice the Gospel of Luke. Jesus came into Galilee after His baptism, filled with the Spirit, and preaching the kingdom of God. A message of good news. A message of joy. And of course, there was joy at Jesus' resurrection. Can you imagine? These men had forsook everything to follow Jesus. They had left all of their chosen occupations. Matthew was a tax collector. Peter, James, and John were fishermen. And Peter was married. He'd left his family behind. And he watched his entire future die on the cross. But then, Jesus was alive again and appeared to them. Can you imagine what joy they must have felt? Well, that same risen Lord is there to bring the same joy to your heart today. All you have to do is ask. During the days after Pentecost, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit, Acts 13, 52. They were having such a good time that everybody thought they were drunk. In Acts chapter 2, these men are full of new wine. It says, we're not drunk, it's only 9 in the morning. Instead, this is what was promised by the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit and... You will prophesy. Everything the Apostle Paul did was done with joy. The list goes on and on. I could spend literally hours on this, but I won't, which would be to your great joy. <laughs> but God's Word is alive with joy and with fullness of joy. You know, there was a fellow who bought a cow once. And he took it home and he had trouble. That cow kept drying up. And people would ask him, say, well, you know, what are you doing? He says, well, I don't know. You know, I'm trying to be sparing with it. You know, when I just need some milk, I go out and milk it. And that's only about once a week. And they said, no, you've got to keep it flowing. The same thing is true with the joy of the Lord. We have to keep it flowing. And that comes through a living an abiding relationship with Christ where we spend time in His Word every day. We continue, as Hebrews 10.25 says, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together with other believers. We continue in word and sacrament which helps our faith grow. And with our faith, our joy. God-centered worship is an expression of that joy. God says to worship is a celebration and would you believe, you talk about tithing, one-tenth of Israel's gross national product was devoted each year so that the people of God could come together and have a great party. Did you know that? Look at Deuteronomy chapter 14. If you doubt that for a moment, look at Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 14. Beginning with verse 22. 
I got my small print Bible today, so it'll take me a second to get over there. Deuteronomy 14, 22. Be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce each year. Eat the tithe of your grain, new wine, and oil, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks in the presence of the Lord your God at the place He will choose as a dwelling for His name, so that you may learn to revere the Lord your God always. But if that place is too distant, and you have been blessed by the Lord your God and cannot carry your tithe because the place where the Lord will choose to put His name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver and take the silver with you and go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, or anything you wish. There you and your household shall eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice. Now with a party like that, can you imagine anybody saying, I don't want to go to church, it's boring. Not on your life. And so folks, true worship is an expression of joy. And we find that out in this passage. Why did the Galilean fishermen leave their nets and follow Jesus? It was because of the joy of the Lord radiated from him. And it was an irresistible attraction. Why did Levi abandon his cash booth and follow him? There had to be something about Jesus that was irresistibly attractive. And it was joy. Jesus was such a man of joy, merriment, and gladness that he was irresistible. The early church must have had that same attraction. That's why thousands of people came to know Christ. Now folks, we don't need to be Lutheran mules. We need to radiate the joy of the Lord. That's why Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Listen, if you're going to witness to the disciple of Jack Daniels, you better have some joy. He feels good one day a week. <laughs> now I want you to hear a few early traditions and quotes, and I'll close with this. <laughs> We don't know if that's true or not, but some say it was by the famous Easter Midnight Sermon of John Chrysostom, which means golden throat, from the 4th century. In that message, he described a vision of Christ confronting the devil and laughing at him. This theme is echoed down through the years in the Christian experience. St. Francis of Assisi advised, quote, Leave sadness to the devil. The devil has reason to be sad. Which makes sense. Someone once said, if the devil reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. Martin Luther wrote, quote, God is not a God of sadness, but the devil is. Christ is a God of joy. Even John Wesley, who is known for being somewhat of a religious sourpuss sometime, wrote these words. Sour godliness is the devil's religion. The truth is, Satan can't stand the sound of holy laughter. Are we reflecting the joy of the Lord in the church that Jesus founded? Are we conveying the joyful spirit of early Christians? You know, during the hockey season, you can see an awful lot of joy. People go to hockey games and they cheer on their kids. They might even get mad and argue with the, with the calls that are made sometimes. And that's true with the basketball games and the football games and the other sports activities. Can you imagine people making the same excuses about the sports activities they attend that they would make for not attending church? Think about it. I don't go to hockey games anymore. They always ask me for money. Or how about this? People say, I don't go to church because the pastor never asked for my advice. Well, I don't go to hockey games because the coach never asked for my advice. Or I don't go to hockey games because the seats are too hard. 
or it's too cold or too hot. Too many games didn't fit into my schedule. My parents took me to too many games when I was growing up, so I'm not going to hockey games now. But you hear people say, I don't go to church because my parents took me to church too many times. Boy, you hear it all when you're a pastor, trust me. <laughs> or I don't take my kids to games because I want them to make their own choices about what sports they like when they grow up. People say, I don't take my kids to church because I want them to make their own decision about their own religion when they grow up. Folks, what would you do? How, do you do that about whether or not your kids brush their teeth? You know, I, I don't want my kids to learn to brush their teeth. I'll let them decide about that later when they grow up. <laughs> their soul is more important than their teeth. We forget that. Have you ever wondered what it is that God must feel like when we get more excited about a NASCAR race or a hockey game or a basketball game than we do about the Savior who suffered, bled, and died on the cross for us? That's something to think about. And that joy is there for us if we will but ask and we will but walk in faith. You think about that. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message from First United Lutheran Church.